Our esteemed guest this month is the internationally renowned actress, writer, photographer, and filmmaker Esther Anderson. Her current film, The Making of a Legend, speaks to her personal and professional interaction with one of, if not the world's most influential revolutionary musical messenger, the Right Honorable Robert Nestor Marley, affectionately known as Bob Marley. Mrs. Anderson, welcome to Cutting Edge's Audio Moment. Well, thank you very much. Glad you've invited me. Not a problem. I'm glad that I'm actually talking to Jamaica, right? Wonderful. Uh, Esther, you're a trailblazer an accomplished Caribbean Jamaican woman who, at a time when this was rather far-fetched, left your island home to become an international talent. Tell us about your Jamaican childhood and what prompted you to leave for the world. Well, um, my childhood is very, you know, I grew up in lush landscape in, 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 in St. Mary and, um, you know, was uh, a, a very strong um, upbringing and shelter at the same time. However, when I came to Kingston from St. Mary, um, I was putting some women saw me and put me in this Miss Jamaica beauty contest. Uh -huh. And I, I, I got a prize. I got me enough money to get off the island because my father was totally against everything, including, you know, we leaving home. None of us girls weren't really meant to leave home, I think, to stay there because he just, well, anyway, it wasn't, the, it was not easy at home, so we were just, you know, coming into the 60s, we just wanted to grow up and be a part of, of everything that was happening. I loved music, you know, I was there in the countryside and radio just took me away with all the music that came in. That's all we had, really, apart from the libraries. You were from a very protected kind of, a protective kind of environment then. As we all were. Well, I don't know about prote protective, more like hermetic. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> but Jamaican parents, and especially fathers, yes, tend yes, to be very, very protective. So you went to Kingston. They call it that. <laughs> yeah, and you got your first taste, I would suppose, of the big city, you know, even though we were not that much of a metropolis at the time, but yes. it was the nearest that we got to it. Now, now you went to London. Yes. And eventually. And on your arrival in London, you quickly took to the runway as a model. What yes, was getting... it was actually the runway, because I'm not tall enough for runway modeling. Okay, okay. So what I... kind of modeling were you doing? Well, I did a lot of commercials for Africa and the Far East, things like that. And okay. um, I basically was one of the first, if, if not the first Caribbean woman to be on English television advertising an English product, which was unheard of because they tell me when I came to this country I could never get any modeling I might as well go jump in the Thames really <laughs> but um, you know I forged a way there through e the East and Africa and so and then um, I studied drama at the same time helped to start Island Records with Chris and helping the artists from Jamaica I, I grew as a somebody who really wanted to learn about the world outside and, uh, and and maybe it's the background that I came from and you know in, in fact a very full-bodied kind of family with my grandmother's intervention in my life mm -hmm. so um, yeah I studied drama and um, I did a bit because I was studying and so I did a bit of modeling I was a DJ in the nights after drama school so I was the first woman DJ also mm -hmm. in the on the scene so I was brief so many firsts there and uh, I don't know if, I don't know if this negates my next question but my next question would have been uh, what was getting your foot like getting your foot in the door like back then in London in the film world you mean mm, in the film world in the entertainment world period because it seems as if you have done or you have had many firsts Yes, well, you know, the times I came to England, there weren't many people like us. I mean, we were Jamaican girls, and we, were, we were like uh, the it girls of our day, you know. Mm -hmm. we came, and we were all Jamaican beauties that had come over here, we were all together. Mm -hmm. So it was fun, and, they, you know, we introduced Jamaican music on all the pop shows here. My sister and I choreographed the, the, the dances and like ska and things like that. So we were very young and... It was a different time. It was uh, Jamaica when I came was still British. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was independent yet a uh, year after that, of course, two years, yeah, a year after it became independent. So, yeah, it was different for us. And at the same time, it, 
because of where we lived, and so it wasn't as hard as it would have been on the other immigrants who ended up in Brixton or Birmingham, or so you know, okay. we, ended up, we ended up in Mayfair. Okay, was, <laughs> because <laughs> I think you might have been uh, embedded yourself within a freer type of community, the arts community. Yeah, I definitely wanted to learn, and I made sure that you know, I made access uh, in use of the museums and you know, incredible um, architecture and, you know, my fam my father is an architect and so it was his okay. grand grandfather and it always interested me and I guess the arts did grab me from I was very young, you mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. you when I was eight years old with my grandmother and that was it, I saw ballet and my sister danced in ballet because my cousin had a ballet company there in Kingston. Okay. I used to teach all the kids. He had a lot of kids that come from Trenchtown that, uh, you know, he he had them in a dance, uh, teaching uh, this uh, this dance. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. so it wasn't very hard or difficult for you then? In the sense that, you know, I was young and I was sort of, uh, I, you couldn't tell me no, I couldn't do or something. And so it became a challenge and then I would just forge a way through and show them just always just to show them that you can do it I know that I had that sort of um, cockiness and very tomboyish when I was a young girl growing up so you know, nobody could ever tell me anything and, you know. and it seems a lot of confidence and so my next question you forayed into a number of things you forayed into acting uh, writing um, photography you were in was it warm December with Sidney Poitier was it or, yeah. or was it Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? I don't remember. Oh, warm well, December. Warm, warm December. December. Guess Who's Coming to Dinner is a very, very good film, but it's about a subject that people already know about. Right, 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 right. But Warm December is about sickle cell anemia, which over 60 million people of black descent suffers from. And um, it was the first time that disease was exposed or even shown anywhere or talked about on the screen on the or screen. anywhere else. Okay, so how did you get the big? What was your first big opportunity and what happened? Well, I think that my first big opportunity when I was very young because uh, I walked into a producer's office and got a part in a movie, a big feature film with all these big stars in Yugoslavia. And um, I was very young and, and I, I would think that that is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, take, you take the chance and then you go there and you knock the door and, and it, it opens for you and you go through. But uh, I didn't mean that a lot of parts came in my way. You know, I did a lot of things. I did a bit in the Sandpiper with Liz Taylor. And uh, I did the Avengers and other bits and pieces until I finally got my first break starring in a movie. It was a 20th Century Fox film called The Touchables. Okay. And I brought me back to England from uh, uh, Los Angeles. And um, I basically stayed here and made another film for Paramount, which was uh, written by a Jamaican playwright called Evan Jones. And he had won the Oscar. He'd won the Oscar a few times for various screenplays that he had written. So that was very good work because it represented England in uh, the Venice Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And he won a director's award. And yeah, and then it just went on from there. I got, I did, got to star in a movie with Sammy Davis. I played his girlfriend with which Jerry Lewis directed, and I learned a lot from Jerry because I was always interested in the directing side of being on the other side of the camera. Mm -hmm. you know, because what? people said you know, you're pretty and all of that, but that doesn't, he wasn't, it, it didn't grab me. I always wanted to learn mm -hmm. all the time. So, Well, this is very enlightening for me because some of the... Some of the things that you're telling me now, I had no idea that you did well, this. So this is, you. this is a teachable moment for me <laughs> or, or a learning moment for me. Uh, but you've worked with so many big names. Now, we're going back to what you're currently doing now, which is your film, your documentary that you've made, The Making mm -hmm. of a Legend. And most people know that you played a very important role in the professional lives of the whalers, Bob, Peter, and Bunny. And yes. in the case of Bob, it went beyond that, which we won't talk about because the film is about that. But yes. uh, what were the whalers like as to use your own words, young musical revolutionaries? Yes. 